Dear Father in Heaven, we are grateful to Thee for the opportunity to serve the fine people of this community and to sit and discuss some policy items that can benefit the citizens of this town. We ask always for Thy inspiration to make wise decisions, those that are most beneficial in the long run for posterity in years to come. We ask and say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right, we will call the meeting to order. Welcome to the uh, June 6th Committee of the Whole meeting. We welcome our media. Uh, Corey with uh, Channel 32. And uh, we've got a fantastic delegation. Uh, our 4 o'clock is Mr. Tim Court. And uh, so uh, with no further... Oh, we need to adopt this agenda first. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, I understand we have a couple of additions to the agenda. Start over in the corner. Um, Councillor Edmonds, what was yours related to? Axia. Axia, okay. All right, so that is... We're going to put that under questions 8A, Axia. And then, uh, Councillor Creed, did you have one? No. No? Okay, coming around, Councillor yeah. well, 8B. Electrical. Uh, system. electrical. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Madam Mayor, do you have any No, no I wasn't going no. to. So that brings us to Councillor Bangry, 8C. Uh, two of them, uh, vehicle purchases. Vehicle purchases? Yes. Okay. And uh, public works. Vehicle purchases and then 8D public works. Yeah. If in the course of the meeting, uh, Councillor Barnes comes up with a, an additional question, we'll ask it at that time. Thank you. Uh, and I'll make a motion to approve agenda as uh, altered or whatever. Fabulous. <laughs> uh, yeah. Motion to accept this agenda as amended. All in favor? Yep. Yeah. And none opposed? So thank you. We'll uh, jump right in then to our delegation, Mr. Court, for the uh, War Memorial Project. So give us give us the rundown. Okay. Very exciting. Madam Mayor, Council, Jeff and Jill. Got your name about Jack. We have a <laughs> 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 it could be. Let's stick to the script. <laughs> 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 and, uh, yeah, both clean and out of work, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'd like to discuss and get Council's feelings on um, the war memorial that we have and the one that we possibly could put in its place or at least enhance it. Um, every time I look at the memorial, of course, I for some reason have an interest in, in this. Uh, our memorial was designed and built for uh, World War I. Uh, it even says 1914 to 1918 on the bottom. So it's been there for a long time, which is great, and it looks good, and it's like a lot of other memorials. I guess my only concern with it is the uh, front plaque that has, when, when we built this memorial back in the 1920s, there was, I think, 20 some odd, 24 names, I believe, or something like that for World War I. They fit nicely on both sides, and it looks very good. Uh, in 1945, when World War II ended, we had an additional 48 or 49 soldiers from our area that did not return. Uh, former Mayor Hardy talked to me one time when we were both teaching school side by side and he said uh, he believes our county had the highest number of fatalities per number of people signed up in Canada. Mm -hmm. And so that War Memorial did its job, I believe, for, 19, for the First World War. It's done its job since then. I guess my concern is that uh, we could maybe honor our World War II veterans a bit more by giving them a little bit more, I don't know if you want to call it publicity, I worry about our generation, another 20 years, 30 years, most of us will. You'll still be here, a lot of us won't be. <laughs> you know, these two should still be here. And I worry that once we get the veterans gone and some of our generation that remembers the war, at least I remember people that were in the war, that the memorial is just not going to mean as much because they can't really tell who's on there. And so it's kind of my proposal that we uh, enhance or rebuild or put another one in its place. And I'll show you some pictures of... Yeah, okay. The first one he's going to show you is, of course, our memorial. The next two deal with the one that Raymond did not replace the memorial with, but they put up on their Temple Hill Cemetery. One is a close-up, and one is a distance one. And the last one is one I look, thought would look nice out there as well. But we haven't really come up with a design yet. I've been talking to Remco through uh, Kenny Peterson. It's going to be cost-wise, we're probably looking at thirty to 50000 somewhere in that area. So it's not excessive. Um, um, Veterans of Repair Canada has a grant program out there where they will cover 50% of the cost. The other 50% would be uh, in kind or funding from a community source of some kind. This grant this can only be 
can only be applied for by the service club. So at 7 o'clock tonight, I'm going out to the Legion. I've already talked to them about this project. I've talked to the boys next door, or the, the group next door. I've used talked to their president about it. And they don't seem to see there would be a much of a problem just looking at it as far as that goes. So this project would probably, I, in my mind, I would replace the cenotaph that we have. I would not get rid of that cenotaph. I would move that cenotaph out to the, to the uh, cemetery, to the, the field of honor that we have out there where there are several of our, our veterans that, are, that survived the war that are buried out there. We could put that in a nice little corner, make it very nice. I've already talked to the cemetery, I've talked to Doug, to Doug uh, Blackmore, and he thinks it's a doable thing as well. Just to show what the guidelines are for us here. The, the, so we are definitely eligible for this. The project, to be eligible, the project must commemorate the achievements and sacrifices of those who served Canada since, 19, since 1867. The project may be related to the construction, the restoration, or expansion of the community war memorial. So bingo, we're right. That's dead on what, what I would like to see happen. They must be of a, clear, of a definite duration with clear start and end dates, so not something we can deal with later if, if you decide that we would like to go along with this project. So that's what I've got in the back of my mind that's been cooking for the last month. We would put any new memorial or, uh, at first when I was looking at this, I was talking to Ken Peterson, I thought, well, why don't we just put, build a twin one for World War II out there? And I got thinking that might not look so great to have a World War I and the twin next to it or behind it or somehow. And for me, it just didn't sit well. So I would like to replace it with the more enhanced version, so to speak. It can look like this or it can look like what I'm showing you. The problem with the one we have now, if we try to just enhance that one, is we'd have to make it quite a bit bigger, quite a bit taller. And so I think there are other ways to do it with, without incurring the cost that may, be, that may go with that. So that's what I'm here for and that's just what I'd like to throw out there. And so after you looked at that, I'd certainly like to entertain any questions you may have. I have one just out the gate. Um, I understand uh, wanting to pay respect to World War II. Is there, have we lost any servicemen since then? I checked that. We really have. As a matter of fact, I talked to Jill about that, but we're a little busy with taxes right now, so I'm not going to do anything with it. I may, we may have found two more that should be on that cenotaph. There's a Hugh Card Brown that was born here in 1919. He left in 1921. Hubie Brown's son. We do claim the family, even though he moved to Lethbridge and signed up there, and he was killed during World War II. And some of the people that have done the plaques for us in Edmonton sent Jill a list and she gave it to me. There's four or five names and I was able to find two on there. Clark, uh, the car of them, Brown is one of them. Another one is um, William Frederick Wadsworth from the Blood Reserve. He is buried at St. Paul's. I've been out to his grave with, with Gary Fox. He died after the war in November of 1945. I have not been able to find any information on what happened with him. A lot of times, we, we've got World War I vets that died later on of wounds and, and everything else. And I don't know, I'm trying to find out what's going on with William Frederick Wadsworth. So possibly we can have <coughs> two more names on that cenotaph if, if we so decide that's the route we want to go. So, yeah. And I don't know of any that died in the Korean War, Vietnam, or, or um, we've had veterans serve in Afghanistan, I know that. But we, I'm not aware of any that passed away except for World War I, World War II. Councilor? You answered my question. I was just wondering about the Korean War and the ones after that. Mm -hmm. Well, again, we've had people in our town that fought the Korean War. I'm not aware of anybody that, that mm -hmm. passed away okay. in the Korean War. Just wondering, uh, there is still a possibility that we could have somebody serve somewhere in the Absolutely. world. Absolutely. And I'm just wondering if, if you thought, you know, when you you know, would design that, maybe to Absolutely. have a space somewhere? Yeah. So what yeah, one of the problems that one we're dealing with now is it's quite cramped already, obviously. Yeah. And I don't believe the 48 names from World War II are on there as good as they could be. Right. So that is a possibility, obviously, that you could leave a space or you could add on, depending on what design you use, mm -hmm. you could add a column on. You could add another panel on to it. Okay. That happens quite a bit. Yeah. Councilor Baker? Tim, I like the location of, of the cemetery mm -hmm. here, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, how about an arched wall? A memorial wall and then you could put your your different wars in it everything is open I'm waiting for, ready for anybody that's got designs that you know, that, that that you may come up with or like I like the idea of the panel this way I don't know what the cost would be on that um, a lot of bigger war memorials have the panels like the Vietnam War Memorial they find people they add on to it 
And I, I like the idea that it could come around, you have World War One, then you could have World War Two, then another panel maybe or whatever, or you could have them side by side with something in between. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of options out there. There's a company in Edmonton I know, that does this. Remco will do any design we want them to do. Mm -hmm. really, so. Tim, the only thing that I think we should maybe pay attention to is the fact that we have a building that's really a historical building mm -hmm. that has a certain style. And I'm trying to figure out how, how You're can talking we... talking courthouse here. Yeah. How can we make sure if that uh, memorial is there not to take away mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I don't. I don't envision a giant memorial taking you, taking with that from yeah, that courthouse. Because I don't. I, I don't saw, see it taking up any bigger of a footprint than what's going on right now. Okay, all maybe right. slightly bigger, but not. not okay. Not usually bigger. Because I saw one of the picture where it really takes away what's in uh, the you're background. You're talking about the one that has a church in the background or something. Well, that in the one. Background. Yeah, I, that's that, one. That I, I, one. I actually just found that on. Internet, I just yeah. threw it for uh, something. Yeah, to look at. no, I just, but I think it's a good thing because yeah. this to me takes away the beauty of the historical yeah. building in the back. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I actually think that wouldn't be a bad design if you wanted to worry about expansion, but that doesn't necessarily mean what, need, what, what we need to have. I, I like the Raymond one in that um, it's not as big as it actually looks on, the, on this picture, although it's pretty yeah, right. And we could get all of our names on the one panel on the front, yeah. which is nice. Yeah. But again, what's, if this project is approved, then we'll need to get a design, and then we'll have to get the funding filled out and everything But else I think it's a, it's a wonderful idea, and I appreciate you thinking of that uh, importance of keeping the memories alive. So thank thank you. you for having that. I know that the projects are very much close to your heart, yeah, and we have, <laughs> we have much to to prove on your really great passion. I'm very happy with the way the town has backed any project that we've ever thought about as far as our veterans go. That's been very, really great. Been very and a lot of people have it. come and seen that and every yeah. every 11th of November they are thrilled to be able to find their relatives or You know, I still get calls from the guys on Lethbridge because they know of our project out here. Uh, Cliff, Chris Clifton is one that he, he he'll find something and send it out to Jill, and then that's, that's how we found. Well, that's one one we found all the pictures that we don't have for one of our guys up here. Um, help me out, Jill. Can't think Wiley? Of Wiley, Jack Wiley. We thought it was John W. It's Jack Wiley. So we'll replace that and put his picture on there. So it's always an ongoing project. So, but it's it's good. It's, it's Thank you, uh, Councillor Barnes. So um, so help me to understand. You're you're not. Considering taking the one down, you're just considering yeah. adding to it. it no. Um, I really I, like what's there. I thought about that as well. I thought maybe we could put one in behind it, the World War II one, very soon, not only a bit bigger. And I got thinking of the, how it would look, and <laughs> not really. If we were going to do that, I would put them side by side and put something in between. Yeah, I, I, I like what's there. I mean, mm -hmm. it's really touching to me because I had family that served in World War One as well as two. Yeah, I, I do as well. And, and I just wondered if there's any way we could just do something like like Councilor Bangry suggested, around the sides and the back or something like that. We could look at that. Like a little um, grotto sort of thing. What you would do is um, remove the front plate off of this one, the World War Two plate. And maybe work something in behind. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd worry about how much space it's going to take to build it behind, but everything is open and we haven't got any designs yet. Yeah. And that was the first thing that Ken Peterson and I looked at was maybe one similar to this. We, I don't think we can make this one work for everything that we want, as far as the names and the size of the, how it should look. Uh, again, if it doesn't work, this, this would go out to the field of honor out of the cemetery. Which I, which I think is really kind of neat as well. A lot of probably more people out of the cemetery than they do drive by here. You mean remove this one and take it out there? Put it out the cemetery in the field of honor. Councillor Creed. Is that a bad idea? Yeah. yeah. Just wondering, you know, with, with respect to you know Ken Peterson, I, I used to sell monuments for Remco at one time, and okay. and but I also sold monuments for Southern Monuments for a time. I just and I'm just I'm just wondering if it'd be worthwhile just to you know be a little competitive on uh, on this I, I, if you've looked into it or uh, we will uh, I know Remco did not build the one in Raymond mm -hmm. um, for some reason the guy just went ahead and did it. his whole thing never passed it through anybody just mm -hmm. did it 
and they, they messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I'm just wondering if, if it would be worthwhile to, to you know, to, to be, you know, be a little competitive and... and, and I can and understand try, that. Ken Peterson's places. in town and that's why I talked to him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, actually, actually, on the back of this one, they, dot, they put all the names very close up for some reason and left a big gap at the bottom. Mm -hmm. My dad was on the cemetery board at the, yeah. at the time. He said, we're not accepting that. Well... So they had to redo the front, the so you yeah. spaced out property. Well, I, th I think we definitely have to have the design, and, and, and you know, I mean, even if you're yeah. being competitive, you've got to be able to give. I can get on Southern Warm News website easy enough to see what they're offering, what they're doing. Yeah, it's, yeah I mean, so so that everybody's bidding on the same, the same. Yeah, we have to get the design down to that. Get the point. design down totally. Yeah. yeah. So if that's council. I, I mean, just just a thought. I you know, yeah. sometimes it's worth it to, to you know at least yes. check a couple places. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can I just ask uh, you, Jeff, is Shem a graphic artist? Uh, no, technically, okay. but he does good work there. Um, I just was wondering if he... If These he monument be... companies have people that can throw designs together okay. in a hurry. Okay, if you right. give them a picture out there, they'll say yeah. something okay. back to them. Okay, yeah. I'll get you. Thanks. Uh -huh. I still like the idea of a curved wall. Could you put <laughs> could you put a curve a curved wall on each side of this, take the plaque off the front, and use that as the centerpiece? Yes, you could. You know, uh, your footprint would be a little bit bigger. I, yeah. But everything is right here. I just wonder if we're not to move any trees. I'm trying not to move any foliage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you wipe it out the front, you may run into that problem, tree problem. You know, but. Say the beer, right? If you just give me a second, Kenny was going to send me a text. I've been waiting for Remco for quite a while to send me something, and it's while you're looking that up, Jeff, you had a thought. Well, I was just going to say if, and we can talk about this. This is on again later in the agenda. So I think what we need to determine is if council supports in principle and wants us to work with Mr. Court. That's what I'm We can start getting those quotes, but then I'm assuming, and this is maybe a question for you, Tim, is. Okay. Your presentation to the Legion tonight, is that maybe on the anticipation they can contribute financially? Is that I'm the hoping. Okay. I'm hoping. Okay, because we can start looking at what in kind can be done. Just give you a quick point. Who the financial players are and then. Yeah, uh, I, I talked to Sean Kelly and he sent me off to Dave Smith. Okay. And they told me they were having a meeting tonight, so I told my they said I could come down and let me see if I can find other details right here. I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion that we, uh, uh, support this in principle at this time. All right. Okay. Um, Recommendation. We can well, and uh, we also have that on the agenda for seven F. Yeah. F yeah. Or, we we, so we, so we might, we might have you hold off on your recommendation. Okay. Just, uh, but I appreciate that. If I'm reading this correctly, sorry, it, they're for basically the same one that we have out there. Basically, uh, looks like about twenty-two thousand dollars. So it's quite reasonable. Twenty-two thousand. That's what I'm thinking. Unless I'm reading those wrong. Yeah. So you have a side by side, then you say that that has them side by side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'm just in my mind. I can't quite picture them side by side. No. Yeah. For yeah. some reason. Anyway. I do like your idea. If we can work something like that, I can get some center for the other stuff. I don't believe it's going to. If we added. Uh, quite fast. I don't think it'd be more than forty thousand dollars the way it's looking. So I think it's quite reasonable. Half that will be covered by Veterans Affairs, and the other half, the town can, like I said, do some work in kind, cement work, perhaps a few things like that. But council, I just maybe a, a comment generally because um, the names for the the World War One veterans they they are done with with lead. Yes. And oh, it's been a number of years ago that. That they some of them some of the lead had come out, mm -hmm. and they actually hired me to, you know, you know, cast some lead and re repair those. And I'm I'm thinking it's still it's still not the best way to do it. And and, and so I, I I really am in favor of, of redoing the whole thing, you know, getting the names properly uh, engraved in the granite uh, so that uh, at the very least, if we kept this one in the new council, they want to. This is also not just a building one, it's also a repairing one. Right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. And I was, I looked at it the other day, that's what I was thinking, that's, um, it's I don't know why they didn't just engrave them to start with, uh, instead of using the lead, I don't know the reason why. Well, that's just, that's just the way they did it. it there, there's holes drilled in there and then the lead and, yeah. and, and like I say, they, they actually hired me, I had to take some molds 
from the from the impressions and cast some uh, a little bit. But it, it's it's probably not the. I mean, it, it's okay, but I think it would be nice to have have you know properly. the properly cut in you know the the, the well, letters yeah. properly cut. Or, or they're going to last a hundred years. Yeah. If you if you don't, and we get down forty years down the road, and that that's going to start coming out or well, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it was probably vandalized. I don't think it would come out, but it was probably vandalized. Yeah. And Make you put a plaque on there. That would be the other, I guess, um, concern I would have. You mentioned vandalism. Yeah, it could have been. Uh, I, I don't remember. Is this one lit up at nights or not? No, no. no, no. no. I would like day. to see some kind of lighting, lighting on it. Yeah. yeah at nighttime. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, yeah. what I, that, that's also something. That might be the only recurring cost that would come with this project. Mm -hmm. Would be perhaps the lighting for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. so, Even if we talked about a light that illuminated the flag above it. Something. Yeah, it could know, be a yeah. base light shooting up. Yeah. So, just so it's, uh, it's kind of tucked away behind some trees here. It worries me a bit, but so far kids have left it a little pretty good. Yes, they have. So anyhow. So we'll throw up one more solar panel and run around. <laughs> LED. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Okay. Any, other, uh, any other questions for our delegation? Seeing none, we will thank you for okay, your thank you. and this is an exciting project. We're grateful to you for putting some time and effort into it. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, good luck tonight over at the, the Legion. Well, I think talking to the two Legion guys I did talk to, I think they'll be on board. <laughs> yeah, you bet. I'll follow you. Yeah, I'm going to wait 40, 25 minutes to listen to Dr. Russ or not. I'll be able to text you something <laughs> for the deliberations yeah. later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll catch up. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. With our next delegation uh, coming in uh, for a little while, we have time to jump ahead and move to adoption of the minutes. So, yes. I move to adopt the minutes of the uh, May 2nd. May 2nd uh, CCW meeting. All right. Are there any uh, concerns with those? If not, We'll entertain Councilor Barnes' motion to accept these minutes. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. Passed. So that brings us now to 6A. We have uh, Councilor uh, Barnes' family member issue, so he's going to sit in the gallery as we discuss this item. We'll excuse him, Julia. Um, and then what we'll do is just uh, kind of have Jeff come up and uh, share with us how this has changed uh, and evolved since the last time it came across our desk. Okay. Really the details are just kind of coming together. So we're just culminating here a little bit. Um, we have two specific requests from Mrs. Woodruff. One is some cash via the Opportunities Initiative Fund. And one is a number of items that um, we just call them the asks to this point, uh, labor, materials, some logistical help, thing, preparation, things like that. Um, in the background where we put the Opportunities Initiative policy, and I noted that we don't have that amount in that policy. We have 3,200 remaining in that policy for the year, but which is still a considerable amount to, to put towards one event. And then we did a bit of a spreadsheet to try and get a feel for the man machine time from the town and what that ask consisted of as well. And we tried to be um, pretty conservative in the numbers. Uh, I was certainly trying to be cautious not to inflate the numbers as to skew the discussion too much. I'm trying to be very fair with it. Um, but a lot of these types of things take a lot of work and preparation and maintenance and, and remediation. So really um, what it comes down to is does, does the committee here do you want to support both requests, one of cash and one of in-kind? Do we want to lean on one or the other for perhaps a combination of both? And just from my perspective, and only mine at this point, I still, um, well, I I'm, I'm think this is a great activity, and I think it's something that could really take off. I just want to make sure we're doing, doing right by, you know, digging mud pits in the creek valley and remediating those year to year and what, what that might entail. Those, there's still some unknowns that cause me some concern. Um, the, the mud pits being one of them, although I just visited with, uh, with Mrs. Woodruff just before the meeting and she was saying, you know, when we think of, and, and it actually brought a little ease on the subject, she says, what I'd be looking for really is if you could strip the sod and lay it aside 
and then just rototill the, the area and then get it wet. They just run through that and then you move that sod back on. So you're not bringing in material, you're not removing material that we would, you know, peel the sod, which it's not perfect sod there, but you would peel the, yeah. the, the black dirt layer, let's put it that way, set it aside as best we could and then simply rototill what's there and get it wet. That's relatively easy to remediate. You know, I think it would be okay. Um, but there's just a lot of unknowns, and so it brings this question of what level of involvement are we at as an organization with this event? You know, I think it's intended to be independent, ultimately. I think that's the goal, and I think that's great. Uh, just, just how much do we jump in? So we're at a point where Mrs. Woodruff has advertised. She's taking registrations. <laughs> this thing is on in some form. <laughs> um, and I think, I think it can be a great thing. I just want to make sure we're all comfortable. Madam Mayor. My uh, concern is a little bit of the ask in cash because the initiative that we have for new ventures of that sort, we only have 3,200, so we're short. Uh, and if we deplete that account, and we have anybody else who comes with a desire for another opportunity to do something in our town, we have nothing to offer. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if we should maybe, uh, considering the amount, the fair amount of uh, um, in kind that is going to be given, and I think the idea is a wonderful idea, by the way. Uh, it doesn't distract uh, from that idea. But should we maybe be more careful with the cash aspect? That's my concern. Uh, yeah, I, towards the end of this, uh, I noted that uh, part of the intent was to donate something, you know, some of the profits back to the town. So I'm wondering if we're, is, is this just a, a risk that we're taking? I mean, saying that, you know, if they have the profits, that, we're, that we, you know, she put two budgets. One one was kind of a break-even budget, and then one was, you know, a hopeful budget with it with some profit in it. So I'm, I'm just kind of wondering how that works. Do we, do we give them some money, and then if they make money, they're going to give, give some back? Is that uh, what's happening here? <laughs> I, I don't know what's your take on it. Uh, yeah, my discussion with Liz has been that they want that kind of a, a benevolent side to it as well, right? That people can donate towards, uh, specifically it's to Park and Recreation Department for initiatives there, which is great. Um, so potentially that's there. Like you use the word, there's there's a risk, it's a mitigated risk, but there's a risk there that that you know, I don't know if it's reasonable to expect a break-even or profit in year one. I think this may be something that grows and probably will grow into something quite substantial. Um, you know, she's showing that she's got a good break-even analysis and even a profitable analysis. I, I don't know, that's the intent. They wanted a benevolent side to this, but I couldn't tell you if that means five or five hundred or five thousand dollars at the end of the day. I, I just don't know. Well, yeah. then I have a subsequent question. Jeff, we have established a budget for this year. If there is only 3,200 in that initiative account, where are we taking the rest from? If we were to accept the 5,000? I'd, I'd have to go have some look at that. I, I mean, do I think that $1,800 is doable? Yeah, probably. You know, that doesn't scare me too bad. I'm sure we can find that at the expense of something. Uh, I just off the top of my head, I, I'm not sure what would be most appropriate to take that. Councilor? Uh, these mud runs are getting to be a very popular thing, and, mm -hmm. and I support this thing. In principle, my concern is that where you are utilizing taxpayers' dollars for a private endeavor, on the condition that we, it comes back to a benevolent fund. There's some comes back to a benevolent fund. So in a roundabout way, we're financing a private endeavor, but we're also financing the the benevolent cause, whatever it is. So, you know, 
there's it's it's six of one and half a dozen of the other sort of thing. Uh, but I I do like the proposal. But there's a lot of work involved in this. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of work in this. So there is council. Would it be possible to use the mud bog at the agrodome rather than creating a new one? We had some discussion. Um, the trail right at this point, the trail that, come on in, Dr. Ruff. Yeah. Well, I'll just have a chair shortly. Um, her, her track doesn't go that way right now. So I'm assuming that there's been some coordination with Mr. Atkins. Half of the track is on his property. And so that's the direction they've chosen to go with it. Um, so that would save a lot of work, and then you wouldn't have to reconstruct it afterwards. Yeah, no, the remediation will take a little doing. Yeah. Um, Plus, they are hoping to get a second pit dug out there, beside oh, the original. I see. And they want to use just stock cars in one, and then all the super ones. Oh, I see. Because what happens is it gets all mixed up, and in the beginning the the stock ones can't get through, it's when they, the other ones get uh, in there. That, yeah. so. the, the other thing to remember with these is the the pits that we, we focus on, like they're, they're one of many obstacles, mm -hmm. right? And so it's tough to make something that's not contiguous to the track out, so out of the way for one obstacle mm -hmm. and then try and capture the rest back out of the way. It would really extend that to some degree. So. Well, if you could bike ride out there or something like that. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Jeff, where we're doing this thing is along the creek bank, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, have we even thought about environment? When we start creating a mud pit yeah. along that creek, you can only go so close to that creek and start tearing up soil and stuff. So we would have to make sure that there was no runoff of muddy water into the creek, which given the location, I think we can manage fairly well, um, but that would be our obligation. We can't, we can't mix up a bunch of muddy water and let it drain that way. Exactly. So I think we'd be okay given the location she's looking at. And again, she's not, sometimes I was envisioning and have been envisioning <coughs> quite large, deep, messy infrastructure here. And I, I think I might be overshooting the scale of it just a bit. You know, it's, again, we peel off the top layer, road <coughs> till the dirt, put some water on it, everybody gets muddy. They do it twice, <laughs> you got yourself a mud run. But um, yes, council, we do have to consider it. There's no question, and that may involve, for example, um, almost by ninth is one of the locations where they want to have some mud, and it is on a side hill. If there was risk of that draining down, we may have to install uh, like silt fence, for example something that would capture anything coming down the hill and filter it before it hit the creek. I don't think that's likely, but we would have to take precautions if we perceived it to be likely. Is it a wise thing to be <coughs> digging up on that hill where we have so much slippage? <laughs> There's some natural low spots there is where she's placed these. There's kind of some slough areas now anyway, okay. and that's where she's placing them. It's kind of where they naturally occur at this point. So. In fact, on the one on that hill, I don't foresee a lot of excavation. There is actually a little pond. Yeah, on there's the standing water, water there now. And I, there is a culvert going through, though, that, yeah. uh, that drains the pond, but maybe if it was... We may have to plug it. Deep, yeah, we might have to yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, anyway, yeah. Yeah, a little plastic bag over it until we get through the event. Well, that's fantastic. Um, my take on this is... Uh, I'm more inclined to be supportive on the in-kind and a little more conservative on the cash support yeah. for this particular event. Uh, that being said, this is the first year. Uh, I'd love to uh, help make, you know, see that it's a success. And I, I, I'm confident it'll be bigger as, it, as time goes on and maybe they won't need the support, the ongoing support. Yeah. Well, like I said, this, this, this mud run, particular mud runs, they're all over North America and I'll tell you they have well, once they get going, it's just like a domino effect. It's it's unbelievable. Right. Mm -hmm. How many guys get involved in this and gals? Uh, yeah, yeah. Just one more. Just just on the timeline and 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 day after the race, send out thank you letters to donors and sponsors. 
I, I just felt like there's, there's actually a lot more that needs to be done on the day after than that. Uh, I, I'm guessing that uh, she's got to clean up all of the obstacles and remove them and <laughs> remediate the area. So I don't know how much they are going to do and how much they're leaving that to us. Uh, to do so, yeah. maybe we should just nail that down. <laughs> yeah. What well, one thing, if I could, Councilor Pewitt, there are little subtle things like you see the race goes down the nature trail and then up the trail towards Sunset Park and down, which is fine, provided we're not blocking that for the Remington for days before, during, and after the race. If they're taking tours, they don't use that a lot. So you know, we would just have to correlate with them. But you know, we we wouldn't be able to permit large constructed obstacles on the gravel path because they multiple times a day, particularly on a Saturday in August, are using yeah. that area. So there is some correlation that's going to need to happen with them. Uh, like Councilor Creed said, we can't let things stay there, built obstacles be there for a long period of time. They're going to be subject to vandalism. They're going to be subject to you know, just obstruction by potentially the Remington or other users. So, But I think those are things we can, you know, logistically, we can work through as long as everybody <coughs> understands going in. Date on, on that race, I just turned to the 18th. August 18th. Weekend after Heritage Week. Oh, so it's after Heritage Week. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure 2018 is the week. New. week before. It's not during Heritage Week. No, it's no, it's this, this isn't it? Mm -hmm. Is it is it slated for this year, Jeff? Yeah. Or yeah. 2018. No, no, what, no. what was the date? What was like the date? Months oh, it is. It's it's the, it is the fifth. Oh, yeah, the fifth. Fifth yeah. of August. That's on page. What is this? Page two of the executive summary after table of contents in her report. Okay. So yeah, it is the fifth, which would put it the Saturday of Heritage Week. Uh, or Saturday before. before. The month. The holiday is the, the seventh. Yeah. Seven. And so Heritage Week comes oh, later on. So it's the Saturday before the parade. Saturday before yeah. the parade. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, so this will help kind of kick off our Heritage Week events. And the ninth is a power. The ninth is a power. That's, that's why I wanted to just check and see if it wasn't going to be in, you know. And this whole Lions Park logistics and well, yeah. mediation <laughs> and cleanup, they all play into that, right? They right. do, yeah. Yeah. So. All right, well, at this uh, time, we'll uh, take any recommendations for council uh, to, to administration recommendations to jump on that and support this initiative. So what, what do we need? Do we need a, a, a motion to approve? Uh, well, you need the financial aspect dealt with. The funding. We, we need to know what level of support we are willing to authorize from our town and our, our crews, our equipment. Uh, as, as the budget kind of breaks down, we're looking at if just, just with the in-kind, it's about uh, almost 3,500. And uh, that's to to me that's a that's a good level of support right there. You know, if we want to help financially, it might not be um, very prudent to exceed our current initiatives available money. Mm -hmm. We've talked about maybe holding back a little bit of that for other initiatives that may come up in the fall or the winter. And uh, so we know we only have is it thirty two thirty two is what's in that account now. If we were to, for instance. Uh, Agree on say a two thousand dollar cash contribution uh, that would leave twelve hundred dollars in there for other uh, other programming uh, that might arise. So that's uh, that's one example of, of the kind of support we can offer. Yeah, I personally would prefer something uh, as proposed by yourself. I think we need to be a little prudent as to how we use the money we have in that initiative budget. If somebody else want to come wrong, it will be unfair in my point of view not to have something, not to have reserved something for a further initiative. I could go along with 2,000, 2,500 at the most, but 2,000 seems better for me. Yeah, yeah I guess my, my question then is, is, is what what does that do? Like, uh, you know, if we don't offer what she what she's asking, is she, you know, she's still able to, uh, you know, Make pull it, it off. You know, I, I, I mean, you know, if she can, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of with you, but I'm just, I'm just kind of wondering what that does to the event and and how 
so do we have do we have any indication? I guess I guess you know people can ask for what they want, but uh, can they still pull it off? <laughs> sure. But that is a business model. You have to. Yeah. Well, that's 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 yeah. Deal maybe with right. other, other things. Keep in mind, if this is initiative money, according to the policy of the uh, initiatives of the Currents and Opportunities Initiative we would essentially also be agreeing to a percentage of assistance in the uh, subsequent years. Yeah. Well, three so years. if we authorize, let's say, 2,000 this year, to five years. it'll be, I think, 1,600 next year automatically mm -hmm. uh, without having to come back yeah. to council. 80, 60, 40. Yeah, 80, 60, 40. Five years. Mm -hmm. Et cetera. So uh, with that in mind, I'll entertain a motion to support this on the level you're comfortable with. I think I would put a motion forward uh, to um, support uh, Ms. Mrs. Liz Woodworth request with in-kind uh, support from the town to build the run or support for the run and uh, $2,000 from the initiative, opportunity initiative policy request to support the financial needs. And then just on the side, to title the highest honor, the Cronin Warrior. <laughs> <laughs> no one is. go in each counselor's name. <laughs> <laughs> you can raise money in having me in it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so to yeah, understand. That, that's what uh, to do the difference. To understand your motion, uh, we're looking at supporting the in-kind portion of the request and the cash request up to $2,000. Uh, Councilman? Uh, who's going to build all these walls? She's her. got that. She's got her that covered. She's, she's, okay. yes, John. Yeah. See, Councilor Creed's question, I just texted Liz, and I said, is the $5,000 to make or break, if it's less, is the event still on? She said, absolutely. I'm asking for the moon, but I'll take the stars. And <laughs> okay. she says, anything would help. Okay. So I didn't Thank give you. her any indication of that number, but just wanted to make sure to Councilor Creed's question it was not a make or break. Thank so you. I appreciate the it. Thank you. So uh, the motion is on the table, support in kind as requested, and uh, the cash contribution up to $2,000 this year, uh, with this being an initiatives grant, uh, and she can tap into percentages in the subsequent years. So the $2,000 is from the opportunities? From the opportunities initiative. But in initiative. Yeah. 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 Next, next year it'll be 16, 16 yeah. 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 yeah, it, it decreased yeah. by 20% every year. If there are no further questions, we'll go ahead and vote on that motion. Uh, this is a recommendation to Council for next week, mm -hmm. so this is a recommendation. Mm -hmm. All those in favor of this recommendation? Any opposed? Seeing none, that passes, and we'll invite Councilor Barnes to join us back here. Council. Just in time for <laughs> our delegation of Dr. Robert Russell. So uh, we'll go ahead and turn the time over to you, sir. Please uh, come and uh, get us up to speed on this. Can I get, get behind the podium? If you like. <laughs> we have a little microphone there, so either way. Okay. Or you can come up and come over a chair if you want. Dr. Do you want a chair, uh, Dr. Russell, if you want, if you're more comfortable? Or, no, if I stand, up. I have a limitation to how long I'll talk. How long you know it's To the mayor and council assembled, it's a privilege to come and meet you. But one time this building was a sixth ward and I was the bishop. That was the last the place was used for church service. Oh, wow. Donated to the town. And the next thing is I never saw the council here. It was always downstairs. Mm -hmm. After we came out of the library years before. We shall behave. <laughs> so things change. I come with a very serious consideration of my own and that I have a rental house on 17, 117 First Street East. So if you go to the north end of First Street East, it's on the west side. Across from another house. Down from just north of the house. gas co op. We, okay. okay. We use the house to uh, house the summer students that come for the theater. And we've used it for three years now and it worked very well. We had an incident on last Monday night that could have made national headlines. We had one girl in the house with the other girl, there are three gir four girls in it. The other girl was at a party in the West End, and there was an assembly of seven 
Native friend fellows on the front lawn. One was wavering a knife this long, and they were demanding entrance, and it certainly would have been a physical assault and sexual assault. The girl had presence of mind to tweak to the other girl who was usually coming home alone, not to come alone. So she came with five of the boys from the theater in mass, and the seven people who were making the disturbance disappeared. The girl had phoned 911, and I think she said that uh, the first question asked, are you intoxicated and how, are you high on drugs? Mm -hmm. What a question to ask a complainant. And so we've had nothing but problems. It took 25 minutes before the police arrived, but by that time the crowd had dispersed. The crowd did come back about 30 minutes later, and at that time the police came with two other policemen and the blood band. But at that time, we had the uh, theater people still there. So my concern is how we can have a mass threat in this town. Since we done it, did it, the police have had no inquiries to the perpetrators. They've done no investigation. They haven't asked any description. They just let it go, which I feel is terrible. We have had uh, communication with the police to the father of one of the girls, which was very unprofessional and very impertinent and asking questions that a person could not answer in a court of law because it would be hearsay. So my concern is that the perpetuation of this was probably somewhat initiated by the house across the street, which is reputed to be a crack house selling dope in the middle, in the edge of Cardston. Last Thursday, I personally was cutting the lawn and saw a man come off the road, go through my property, into the house. Two minutes later, he comes out with his hands in his pockets and walks back where he was. I don't have to be too stupid to think, but maybe there was a transaction. So my concern is number one, having a house of distribution of narcotics in the town of Cardston. Secondly, having an incident of inevitable assault, both sexual and physical, had it not been uh, circum, um, circum uh, I was going to say circumcised, <laughs> circumvented by the uh, by the four five boys that came, and I wondered. I have a problem now that the house is useless. It's useless for occupancy. Um, the girls did not go back into the house. They went to Alana's house after, and they were very emotionally upset, and they just wouldn't think of going in there. With the uh, traffic across the street, a family couldn't move into it with children, and so the house is completely useless and vacant now. So my plea to the council is number one, I didn't think it was my part to go to the police. That is their contract with you. But the policing is totally incompetent and has not been successive and has had no investigation as to perpetrators. Not even an apology or an inquiry. And I think it's totally inappropriate for the policing in our town. And I respect the uh, time interval from 11 p.m. till 4 a.m. And this occurred at 2, 2 p.m. or 2 a.m. last Tuesday. So my question is, what can the council do to help us? Either policing in the town, getting rid of the drugs being sold, or uh, reevaluating the house, which, as I said, has no value now. Any questions? Any questions to the council? Councillor Bambury. I haven't got a question, I got a concern. Mm -hmm. When you dial and phone 911, obviously it sounds to me like dispatch is more concerned at your individual purpose for phoning than what the problem is. And I think that we need to, I think we need to have our staff sergeant, uh, when he comes to give a report, we need to question on that
dispatch 911. Where, where is the response there? I mean, they should be immediately, as far as I'm concerned, they should be immediately dispatching an officer to that, that scene. And then worry about the, the follow-up after the, the business is taken care of. That's, that's the way I feel. Okay. My situation is the 911 is hearsay, so it's inadmissible for me. Okay. But uh, it would be recorded. Yes, it would be. I, I went after I spoke with you, uh, Dr. Russell, I spoke to Zane. I wanted to understand a little bit more the time frame of the intervention because I was very concerned that if a citizen in our town calls 911 and is left without uh, support, we in trouble. Uh, so I asked them a little bit the time and I, sh I was shown the exact dispatch paper that came from the dispatch center. From the time of the call to the time of the dispatch, it was 10 minutes that had passed. And I asked why so long? And I was explained that they do a triage, if you want to call it that way, as to which call is going to get a response right away. And maybe um, this call to 911, whichever way it was done, might not have sent the signal that there was imminent danger. That's what I'm wondering. And then I asked him, so how long from the time of the dispatch to you showing up at the house? And he showed me the report, it was two and a half minutes. How many? Two and a half. So that'd be 12 and, the, and a half minutes? Yeah, 12 and a half minutes from the time the dispatch call was done. And so it's still too long when you're in imminent, imminent danger, I totally get it. But from all local people to the incident. It, it went right away. Two and a half minutes is a decent time. It's a dispatch time that is the issue here. The other um, problem that uh, occurred is that the, the, the reaction of that young lady was to call a friend and warn her friends first and uh, it was a wonderful idea. But in hindsight, had she called 911 right away, she probably could have received um, help quicker. But regardless, it doesn't change the fact that there was an imminent threat to that young girl. And it, it breaks my heart to think that we have this type of item. I talked to them also about the house across from your house and um, I, I think at one point it might have been on their radar, maybe not at this time. So I really think, I, I told him I really would like to know if something is going on there. How can we figure that one out without being invasive in people's, on people's property? That's a problem. How do you do it? How do you spy on your neighbor? Legally. <laughs> well, you can have a camera in the yeah. window of the house yeah. that I own yeah. and take a picture of the people coming and going across the street. Well, if you feel the, the point is, this is a criminal investigation. It's not my point. I can only make my complaint. Yes, I totally and appreciate what you're the, saying. The call of the girl that was threatened, one girl in the house to begin with, <coughs> was critical because she knew the other girl yes. was headed home. I mean, I totally and understand. Had she, had she come alone, they would have held her for a ransom to get the door open to have them both. Yeah. But I also believe that one of this, this, those group 
has been apprehended. Very much. There is, they really believe that one of those people that might have been there that night is now apprehended. Is now apprehended? Mm. Councilor Mingri. Uh, we have a peace officer in town, level one, and we can, uh, we can ask him to keep an eye on that situation because he has the authority to arrest to uh, video whatever he wants to do to curb that action. Yeah. And maybe, if sure there is. and well, that's for him to check it out. Mm -hmm. And I and I think he needs to be assigned that, that, uh, that assignment. To well, as I said on Thursday, I was a first person witness to a transient man going to the house and going back. And uh, I couldn't prove it, but if we'd apprehended him, we might have found his pockets full. Along also with, with setting up a, a, a camera, maybe on that street, that will view down that street, because we've, we've had other actions in the, in the community where our camera has picked up quite a bit of traffic. Well, the next thing that happened is I got in my car two days ago, and the night before someone had come in and pilfered all through the car, took the wash, uh, the money for car washes out. Out of your vehicle? Out, out of my vehicle, oh, right in my driveway, in my was front yard. Was your car locked? It wasn't locked. No. You don't keep it on your ashtray, not cigarettes, eh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've done my presentation. <coughs> uh, just something that's relevant to this whole thing. I, I had a native fellow come into my, into my, um, Office, into my office today and he's been trying to find a rental property for quite a long time and uh, he said that uh, someone had wrongly reported him as being a, a bootlegger having uh, done damage to his own property having been um, a very poor renter I don't know the gentleman that well but I uh, he was really upset that somebody would say that to keep him because they they want the properties instead of get him getting it they want some somebody else wants it right but anyways he said I don't understand why I would get accused of being a drug user drug dealer too he was accused of that as well he said we have a problem in this town and I listened to him and I said anything particular he says it really upsets me that the people from, the, I don't know whether they're from our reserve or where they're from, but he said, they're sitting on the Cahoon Hotel and there could be a, a whole pile of them up there. He says, why aren't the police stopping them? They're all over there sniffing. They're all taking drugs. I watched them, passing them back and forth, selling the, de they're dealing right there, dealing on the street, and they're all sniffing, and he was showing me what they do. And I've contacted and I've called myself, because I see it all the time. I'm right there on Main Street, and I see them across the street in the Elko, right north of the, the um, model, sauce. Model millinery. They're doing it all the time. And I don't understand why, I never hear of any charges, I hear, no, never hear anybody apprehended. I make phone calls and, and John, my business partner, we've made phone calls, we've watched them, and it takes forever to get a response. And that's not even a 911, that's a direct call. And I, so I don't know what we have to do to enforce these situations. And, and your problem, Bob, is exasper exacerbated with the use of drugs and substance abuse. They get really brave when they do that, and they don't make sense. I don't understand why they can't be taken off the streets. I don't understand it, and it's very frustrating. And I understand where you're coming from, Bob because I've had that experience with on the street and I, I don't like it either. And so I don't know what our, how we can get that through to our police that this is a very serious situation. What are their limitations? And we need to ask that of our staff sergeant. Way to comment, I think. Uh, uh, no, I, I, I don't know. Uh, so okay. Councillor Bengri and then Mayor Crow. Dennis, to uh, sort of enlighten you on something, I was talking to both our 
our sheriff, if you want to call him that, peace officer. Mm -hmm. And I was also talking to the Main Street uh, person, mm -hmm. the bylaw officer. Mm -hmm. And I have observed the bylaw officer walking Main Street, and he does move those people. Mm -hmm. um, his concern is if there's 10 or more on, on Cahoon Hotel steps, mm -hmm. three or four doesn't bother him. Mm -hmm. And he is moving them off. He's doing an excellent job in, in this past month. I, I have seen it work. And, and there is charges being laid by our peace officer. And uh, <coughs> he's basically straying them out of town. So those two people are working very close to and with the RCMP and so But, you know, I just wanted to tell you, Dr. Russell, that I brought this incident to the, um, to one of the counselor that sits on she, in a standoff. Uh, it's Marcel Wieselhead. Uh, we had a, just a meeting earlier on and spoke to him. They're concerned about that. And they're also working uh, diligently right now to try to understand uh, the population in, in Moses Lake, especially the youth, and try to provide them some alternative initiatives to try to get them back on track. That doesn't solve your issue. But I just want to tell you, it didn't, it didn't fall on death there. I did something about it. So to me, banishing a knife on an imposed uh, attempt for invasion is a criminal offense. And the police have laid no charges, done no investigation, and have not even taken first-person statements from the girls. Well, that's I saw a statement. Not right. That's not right. I saw a statement. That's poor policing. So the only thing we need is a vigilante system. <laughs> well, you know, okay. I understand what you're saying, but maybe we need to make sure that all the facts are all there too, because there was a deposition made by that young girl. I think they've made statements now. It, it, I saw the report, so yes. it's there. But why did it take a week? For her to make her statement. The statement should have been immediately or the next day. That's investigation, not a cold track a week after. Okay. Well, we have our uh, RCMP report uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. We'll be sure. No, I don't think we should wait a couple of weeks. I think that now the chief of or the sergeant who has a responsibility of detachment should be making a, a statement to this council. This was not a, a benign, uh, easy thing. It was potentially criminal, only averted by the one girl's uh, text message to tell the other girl, don't okay. come alone. Right. That saved the incident. Right. Yeah. So I wish you well, Council. Thank you for your time. Thank uh, you. This is on the agenda for It's interesting stuff. being on the other side of the bench. <laughs> Well, thank you for bringing the concern to us. It's a concern. Uh, Safety it's and security is a concern for us all. I have a responsibility for those girls as if they're my own children. Sure. And I was very upset that I didn't have any legal assistance in the, in the investigation of the per uh, perpetrators that had been involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Well, we, uh, we, our uh, next delegation is assigned for 530. Uh, we do want to take maybe a few minute break before that time, but we have time to move forward on uh, 6B, the pool, uh, the draft pool admissions. So we'll, uh, we'll move to that <coughs> item. Uh, if, you, if you turn there to the policy, we have, this is a recommendation uh, based on some of their um, procedures 
and uh, talking to Jeff earlier today, uh, and he'll share with us uh, some thoughts where perhaps there is a little too much in here that is um, administrative, and, uh, and perhaps the recommended policy might need to be slimmed down to something that's relevant to governance, and then, uh, and then reference the, uh, the piece. So maybe we'll just turn some time over to Jeff to tell us a little bit about that pool admissions policy and some thoughts on uh, ways we might slim that down to what is relevant to council versus what is administrative. Sure. The, I, I put this in, um, our, my staff put this together, and I thought, you know, it's been the practice of the town since I started that we have all of these things that we want to be consistent and we want to be done the same. They come and they're approved by policy and therefore as staff we're bound to do them this way. So I understand why, we're at, why we do this kind of thing and it, and it makes sense on a certain level. And then, uh, so I uploaded the agenda and then I stewed on this over the weekend and I thought here we have a very specific operation of the pool that to be frank really doesn't have a governance aspect to it. It's how we're doing passes for admission to the pool. And again, I think it's great that we have some procedure and how we're going to do it so it's consistent and fair and done correctly. So it got me thinking about how we're approaching some of these administrative type policies. And one of the, the policies that still needs to be redone is the existing pool, general pool policy. And it goes through things like it just how we deal with the, all the different day-to-day -day things at the pool. It's a really great procedural manual. It's a poor policy. Um, selfishly, from an administrative point of view, the more we put in policy, the more we're subject to political scrutiny on every piece of minutia in the policy. <laughs> so if I ever had a rogue counselor that wanted to challenge me, and the one I use a lot is the current pool policy, says what color of sweatpants the lifeguard should wear on cool days. <laughs> well, if I ever had a counselor that had it out for me and went to the pool and saw that this year they're red, but the policy says navy blue, <laughs> I'm insubordinate or don't want to abide by policy. And really, you, you as council should be just assuming we're going to take care of how people get into the pool. But there are certain aspects of that facility that you want some governance over and that's appropriate. So the example I would use is you want to know that all lifeguards are trained by Canadian lifeguarding standards. So we have a, we're mitigating safety and risk. Okay, You want to know that the facility is operated in compliance with all Alberta health standards for swimming pools. That's important to know. You, you may, because we're a smaller community, you want to know the rates and fees charged because they can be controversial, they can solicit feedback from the public to you. But how we go about administering an admissions pass maybe isn't something you want in your sphere of influence, I guess is what I'm throwing out. So after I put it in the agenda, I got thinking about maybe we should look at a different approach and here's what I want to throw out. Maybe we use the pool as the the example here. You remember we were talking about protocols and, and council protocols and we're going to be developing protocols which are the how-to of, of how we do things. And I've been thinking a lot more about administrative protocols. And so taking the pool, I foresee a policy which contains those four or five important pieces that council wants to ensure are done for the safety and the well-being of the community with our facilities and you should govern those and you should scrutinize those. And then we look at a boilerplate paragraph that we put in that policy that says, attached to Schedule A is the administrative procedure to support this policy. The CAO or designate has discretion to change that, at, or has discretion to change this procedure to meet the needs of the organization. So I don't bring, if I change sweatpants from blue to red, which by the way wouldn't happen, <laughs> but I wouldn't bring that to council for approval because it's not affecting any of the things you want to govern. The other example is Jill and I were talking about this and I was talking about it with Councillor Peboy. We recently spent some considerable time going over the uh, faxing and photocopying costs. Now at the end of the day I'm pretty sure you don't lay awake at night wondering if photocopy should be six or seven cents. <laughs> My guess is it's not an issue, but we, give you, we put it in policy and so it is under your discretion. My guess is that you want to know that we have cost recovery when we do things for third parties, for example, and that we're not undercutting a competitive environment where other businesses in the community can provide that service. So that should probably be the policy. But the schedule is the rates that will change from time to time. So if costs go up next year and it goes to $0.08, cents, I don't bring it to council for approval. 
because it's cost recovery as per your policy. So I don't know if you can see where I'm kind of going with this, is that we've decided over time to put a lot of minutia of administration into policy, mm -hmm. which I get the reason for it. It's not, I understand why it is that way, because people have wanted it consistent and they've wanted to be able to say to the staff, this is a council approved policy and we've got to follow it. I get it and that's fine and it's, it certainly works. It's been working for a long time, it would continue to. But I'm wondering about instead of approving this tonight, because we're already doing this, this is what we started doing this year to, to test out this new system, is if we use this one as a pilot where I bring you back a very concise, cool policy containing the four or five items that you as council want to be able to govern and have discretion over, and then I make you aware of my administrative procedure, how I'm going to carry out the operation of that facility, but if we change the type of picture or one little thing in this next year, I'm not bringing it back to you because it's in the administrative Thank you. procedure. It's in the administrative procedure and it does not affect those governance pieces you want to enforce. Now if it does, if I come back to you and say, look, we're not going to do Canadian life saving anymore, we're going to go with this different organization and your policy requires that, we better have some pretty good rationale as to why and you better be able to support that or not. So, so I agree with that completely. But yeah, when we've gone through this and I looked at photocopying, I looked at excavation, and a number of these things that really drill down the civic center policy. If you want to govern the fact that under the policy there must be something between the bottoms of table legs and the gym floor, great, we'll keep it there. I just don't think you care. <laughs> but you want this facility to be open to the public, you want it to support agencies, boards, and committees, you want it to be safe. So there are some things that should be in the policy, but not that minutia of the knife drawer should have a key lock and given to tenants, which is in the policy, by the way. We can take that out of the, of the governed policy. But this may be, as I've thought about it, a good example for us to use in this new kind of idea format going forward. So I wanted some feedback on that more than what I actually put in the background on Friday. <laughs> Councilor Bangry. I, I, I'm sorry, but I just cannot understand what is going on here. <laughs> From 1965 to 1970, I worked at the swimming pool, and two of those years I managed it. There was protocol from, from Royal Life Savings that you had to have a certain amount of qualifications to guard. You had to have a certain amount of qualifications to, to uh, uh, provide swimming lessons. Your dress code was, was up to the, to the pool manager at that time. And we did not have, we were not allowed to wear sweatpants. Uh, admissions, we, we knew everybody was coming into that pool and we didn't have a policy on admissions because it was just, you know, it just followed. And, and, and I, I have to agree with Jeff that we can policy ourselves to death and, and poor Jeff and, and, and our administration office have to follow that. I mean, there, there has to be some, just some certain guidelines, and then let's stop micromanaging. <laughs> so, and I just want to verify, you don't want to know that if the photo is 640 megapixels? <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, sorry, Madam Mayor. <laughs> I, I really think this brought me to really reflect on what Josh Goff told us. Yeah. have policies and have protocols One page. <laughs> and remember we had that discussion why do we need protocols well this is why we need protocols because protocols are really administrative That's right. how to and we don't need to be bogged down with that yeah. at this table and so my point of view is is a point well taken we now understand Josh <laughs> policies and protocol this is why and so I totally agree with Jeff that this full admission policy is really uh, has two aspects to it that should be truly separated one policy that are the guidelines that affect everybody and the other one at, are relevant to the detail or how we might, how we run the organization from the minute they're open until the day they're closed. I just want to mention, Ken, to 
Councillor Peabody knows this, but I had an exact incident after I was having some of these thoughts <laughs> where we have a policy, this came up just recently. We had a policy on some disposal of assets. We had an incident where we followed the policy, everything was fine, but there was some innuendos to the sale and, and one of my staff came to me and said, you know, we should really add this little line in there so we know in the future we do this right every time. And I thought, so I gotta go get council motion to add just this little thing about how we're going to take deposit. a deposit. And I thought, I don't think they care, first of all. <laughs> now, they want to know that when we dispose of things, it's done at market value, that it's put out to the public. There are some principles you want to govern. Mm -hmm. But the fact whether we take a deposit and then the rest within 24 hours, that, that really drove it home, too. I thought, here, I, I would bring it back for this one line that is so operational and inconsequential, frankly. But it was just something we wanted to make sure we were we had every time so it was consistent. And we always have this discussion about council's involvement in administration and, and what that should look like, and yet I come to you and ask you to approve the smallest minutia of administrative detail. So it's just changed my thoughts a lot about some of these policies, not all by any means. Many need to totally stay in the realm of council and be governed completely by council, no question. But there's a dozen or so that can take a step back, I think. Council Evans, you have a recommendation? A good example of that is, somebody was asking me the other day, what's going on on Pitt Street? There's an excavation oh, down yeah. there. And I said, I don't know. And they said, well, you're supposed to know. And I said, no. <laughs> the only person that reports to me is Jeff Shaw. The rest of the people, I don't care what they're doing. <laughs> they could dig holes all over the town. It's not my responsibility. <laughs> yeah. You know, but they, yeah. they figure it, you're on they town council. So you should know everything that's going on in town. But in a small community, that's that's, that's more that's, usual, yeah, right? That's, but I'll be yeah. frank, I couldn't tell you what Public Works did this afternoon. I don't know either, because mm -hmm. I have to delegate to my people too, right? Mm -hmm. And so people, I had the phone call about, hey, I saw this was for sale. I said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, we get, you got this thing you're selling it. Yeah, maybe, I don't know, call Bart. <laughs> because I just didn't know. But he had policy to say, oh, here's how I do it, it's fine. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Councillor, I know that some of those things, you don't know all that minutiae. Mm -hmm. And just one thing I was, I was reading this over under general admissions, if you look at B3, <laughs> it says adults with children under the age of four must pay for admission regardless of whether or not they intend to use the facility. They are required to within arm's reach of their children at all times. They may not sit or wait in the kiddie pool for free while they supervise their children. They paid. <laughs> You're saying here that they must no, pay. Sorry, it's saying if they pay, absolutely they can. They just can't yeah. not pay and they right. do all that. Yeah, but yes. it's saying here they must pay. Yeah, and they're right. saying so it's there. redundant. Agreed. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So yeah. it's a good, well, it's not a good policy. It's good guidelines, shall yeah. we say, but it has some flaws in yeah. it. Yeah, okay. It needs to be reviewed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's redundant. It's yeah. different places. But I just I thought this may be a good catalyst to look at changing yeah. how we're doing this. Mm -hmm. Well, and perhaps over the next few months and, and coming years, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start seeing more policy and protocol separation. Yeah. Um, one, one suggestion I had for Jeff uh, as we were meeting before the meeting uh, was that you know, the, um, the procedures can still be shared with council and yeah. uh, yep. on things like a committee no, poll, uh, we throw it in there just for yeah. your information, and then if you have any concerns or questions, that can come up at that yeah. time in a committee meeting. Yeah. Okay. So if um, well, just, and I told council people what we may find, and this is the pendulum is going to swing both ways, is that we we do something like this, and there's an issue in the community that they really take exception. You start getting a number of complaints. There's an issue around one piece of the procedure. Mm -hmm. You may say as a council, we're going to pull that and put it in policy. There's been too much backlash or too much concern or too much risk associated with that piece. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to pull discretion on that. And you can do that. You're rightfully, that's your, your purview to look over that policy. So the pendulum may move back and forth a little bit, and that's okay. Now, Jeff uh, informed me he's uh, out of town tomorrow. I am. And so we may not see this item revised for this upcoming the second meeting, meeting in June. but perhaps maybe later the second meeting in June we'll see his uh, separation of policy and procedure. And uh, so we won't take any recommendations at this time. Uh, if that's uh, 
Is there any the objection to the guests to be doing any this? Objections any to that? No, I think. I think. I think we should really work on that. I think we all look forward to seeing the revised policy and what that looks like in light of our uh, what we're interested in uh, on the policy side. <laughs> so good. thank you. We'll uh, defer that then to your judgment and hope to see that by the end of the month. Um, and so that's fantastic. Now we do have a delegation coming at 5:30. Um, we could take a break now and be back in time for the delegation. Let's do that, and uh, then I'll entertain a motion to uh, to recess. recess for a quick break. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. All those in favor? Okay, we'll be back by uh, 5:30. Thank you.